Last week, Tony Blair called for a national debate on the place of Muslim culture in British society. This amid the controversies ranging from the wearing of the veil to protests against comments made by the Pope. Tonight on Dispatches, we explore an argument that underlies much of the debate. The apparent conflict between the traditional British values of free speech and the demands of this country's Muslim population. Tonight we ask, is free speech under threat in Britain? The evidence is that the clash between freedom of speech and Muslim sensibilities is becoming a major fault line. We conducted our own survey for tonight's programme to test the opinion of the population as a whole using the polling company Populous. We asked if they agreed that people in Britain are afraid of speaking out on issues involving Muslims for fear of causing offence. 73% said they agreed. Only 18% disagreed. But a previous Channel 4 poll by GFK NOP found very different opinions in Britain's Muslim community. Asked whether they supported free speech even if it offends religious groups, only 31% said yes, 62%, exactly double, said no. Now, in recent months, works of art, films, newspapers and public figures have all come under fire. In Holland, a provocative film about women and Islam led to the murder two years ago of its director, and earlier this year, violent protest erupted over the publication of a series of cartoons in Denmark which satirized the Prophet Muhammad. Danish embassies in Syria and Lebanon were set on fire, and there were deaths in Nigeria, Libya, Pakistan and Afghanistan. At least 139 people died in the protests worldwide. In London and across Britain, angry demonstrators took to the streets. And then, last month, a speech by the Pope sparked protest again. Pope Benedict XVI quoted lines from a medieval emperor who had said that the Prophet Muhammad was the source of things only evil and inhuman. This again led to mass protests in many countries and was linked to the murder of a nun in Somalia. The Pope's representative swiftly apologised. It was certainly not the intention of the Holy Father to offend the sensibilities of Muslim faithful. Tonight, dispatches will explore these issues with the help of two people with opposing views on freedom of speech. They'll be joined by some of the key people involved in some of the most significant flashpoints on this issue. First is Kenan Malik, an intellectual and writer on theories of human nature and the meaning of race. He is also a passionate supporter of unfettered free speech. Kenan, why? Freedom of speech is the bedrock of an open democratic society and it must include the right to offend anyone. Many people suggest that because we live in a plural society so we need greater limits on free speech. I think the opposite is true. In a diverse society such as ours it is both inevitable and important that people offend the sensibilities of others. Inevitable because where different beliefs are deeply held, clashes that are unavoidable, and we should deal with those clashes in the open rather than suppress them. Important, because any kind of social progress means offending some deeply held sensibilities. If liberty means anything, George Orwell once said, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Free speech is good for minorities, for Muslims, and for society as a whole. That's why we should defend it. Thank you, Kenan Malik. <laughs> Imran Khan is the lawyer behind the Stephen Lawrence and Zahid Mubarak campaigns and often defends individuals suspected of or accused of terrorism. Imran, should the right to freedom of speech include the right to offend Muslims? I'm afraid to say that this debate is not, despite what anyone else might say tonight, about some abstract notion of free speech, but simply an unadulterated, unambiguous, massive attack on a minority in the West. It's under attack from the law, the media, and even from neighbours in the streets. One of the banners 
or dare I say veil, under which this attack takes place, is the completely unrestrained right to free speech. We will see tonight, I'm sure, where the free speech of the type practiced by the Western media really leads. The marginalization, the criminalization, and the demonization of a minority section of our population. Thank you very much, Emily. We want to start by asking whether the angry protests in the Muslim community do pose a serious threat to freedom of speech. Our first guest has been at the sharp end of this debate. He is Ahmed Abu Laban. The whole controversy of the Danish cartoons would not exist without Abu Laban. He is one of the two Danish Imams who kick-started the protests against the derogatory cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad by bringing them to the attention of the global Muslim community. Imran Khan, your questions for Abu Laban. Ahmed, uh, this newspaper, where did it stand on immigration into Denmark? No doubt that Julian's Poston is the biggest newspaper in Denmark. It was leading the anti-immigration and the anti-Islamic propaganda uh, campaign for almost eight years, continuous years. So would it be right to say that the publication of these cartoons led directly to attacks on Muslims in Denmark? Yes, no doubt. It was, in my opinion, the climax of the whole tragedy. And Muslim community in Denmark, is it a powerful community? Does it have a, a big voice? Does it have an equal voice to the newspaper? No, the reality is that we have no access to media whatsoever. So this publication, was it meant to open up a debate or was it to attack Muslims in Denmark? It was a matter of provocation, trying to insult even the uh, editor-in-chief, he wrote in his editorial that Muslims in this country should be trained to accept the humiliation. This uh, newspaper... uh, Imran Khan, I'm afraid that uh, concludes your time there. Kenan Malik, your questions from Abu Laban. Hello. The cartoon controversy is not really a religious matter, but about people like you exploiting the issue for your own political ends. As you know, even in Denmark, there were protests by Muslims against your campaign. Muslims who want to live in a secular society and think that religion is a private issue between them and God. Why should we ignore such Muslim voices and only listen to yours? Because uh, we are a part of this democracy. We have, I, I have the right to be respected in this community. Uh, we, we have been blocked all the time. We have been desperate asking for dialogue and debate. We have been marginalized, etc., etc. But you're not asking for respect. Yes. You're asking for obedience. You're saying that we, newspapers in Denmark, in this country, the rest of us, can only do what you think is acceptable. Please. Bring, bring the issue to its original context. We talk all the time, we make conferences and debates about uh, Islamophobia, where Muslims have been uh, uh, profiled and Islamic behavior in the most negative way all the time. If you are in our position, our feel your feelings and attitude will be completely different. Abu Laban, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Our next guest is Caroline Forest. She is a French intellectual with a track record for courting controversy in the cause of free speech. Once the Danish cartoons protest had started, she took part in the decision to republish the cartoons in a French magazine. Kenan Malik, your questions to Caroline Forest. Why was it important to you to republish the cartoons in France? First of all, it was important to inform the public opinion because as journalist I cannot imagine to judge the center of a polemic like this without showing what is the center of the polemic and secondly it was important because my newspaper is a very anti-racist newspaper but also a very secularist one we made all the time cartoons about the Pope and we cannot imagine uh, just to not to refuse to publish the same things about Mohammed even if it's the prophet of Islam and I must say at this point that we, we are making a clear distinction between the criticize of the religion as an, an ideology 
and to criticize of Muslims as individuals. This is why I'm seeking that, for example, a word like Islamophobia, it's really a word who is making a confusion between this secularist approach and a racist approach, and we choose the secularist one. In other words, the label Islamophobia is often used not to highlight racism, but to silence critics of Islam. Definitely, and, and I think this is the center of the debate here, because we are lucky to live in a part of the world where we have the right to exercise this spirit of criticism about religion. Many, many, many countries are not in the same case, and many, many people are coming from the Muslim world to live in Europe because of this spirit of liberty. We are in an international context where the big battle here is not between civilization. I do not believe in that. It's not between West and Islam. The struggle here is between fundamentalist and modernist. If we choose to intimate or to ask to modernists, even in Europe, to not criticize religion, they're going to lose, and it will be our fault. Critics. Critics suggest that the demand for free speech is really an attack on minorities. Do you accept that? If someone is saying or writing that, for example, Muslims are all uh, violent people just because they are Muslims, yes, I would say it is a racist approach. But this is very different with a text saying, for example, that Islam can have some tradition where anti-feminist, sexist, homophobic, and this, for me, is just secularism. So we have to be very clear there. Of course, racist approach is not acceptable. But today, the Islamist groups are trying to use the word Islamophobia to avoid blasphemy, not racism. And I support the right to offend, and I am supporting the right to continue to make blasphemy, because this is, again, the only way to support liberties in front of fundamentalism. Kenan Malik, thank you very much, Steve, for your questions. Imran Khan, your opportunity to cross-examine. Carolyn Forrest, um, do you accept that everybody is entitled to liberty? Yes. Do you believe that everybody has liberty? No, I think there is many Muslim countries where women, for example, have no enough liberties. In the West, do minority communities not have the same liberty as the majority white communities? I think the minorities in the West are, can be discriminated yes. and I'm fighting against this discrimination. discrimination. They don't have the same liberties that you say that everybody should have. Do you well, accept there is, that? There is a difference between liberties and discrimination. For example, in some Muslim countries, even on the low level, people have no the same rights. We are talking about the and, area which you and published. I'm finishing. Uh, and I'm in finished. the West world, in the West world, at least, we have all the same rights, but still, on the ground, there is discrimination we are against this equality on the fact. Some people have more power than other people. Do you accept that? Yes. Yes. If the, most of the mass media is controlled by a tiny minority, say Murdoch, who really puts our free speech in danger? It's not the Muslim community, it's the press barons who control that media. They influence it in whichever way they feel. <laughs> As journalists, I cannot accept the plot conspiracy explanation. I'm not I'm suggesting sorry. any conspiracy. Yes, you're suggesting that. I'm not. Let me tell you one thing. I have some friends uh, who try to explain to me that publishing the cartoons was to be part of the Bush administration American conspiracy against the Muslim world. America and George Bush was strongly against the publication of the cartoons because they are not, from my point of view, enough secularists. I am a feminist, I am a left person, and I did publish those cartoons by feminism and by secularism without no plot behind them. So Final question then, because I know I'm going to run out of time. As an advocate of free speech, would you say it was wrong if somebody complained about, say, an article which said that Nazis had the right to say that Jews sacrificed Christian children, or that paedophiles have the right to say that sex with children is innocent? Here you, you're trying to do exactly what no, no, the Iranian... No, no, please answer the question. I'm asking, I'm asking, the difference between your conception of freedom of speech and mine well, is, what is again, the difference? What is the, difference? the difference is, for me, for example, in my newspaper, we would never make a joke or humor about colonization, slavery or discrimination. So you're not exercising freedom but of speech in that regard? We are exercising free speech about 
all religion. I did made a would distinction you, against you, uh, would you Jewish publish, fundamentalism, Ms. Christian Ress, would you publish those things in that newspaper? I, mean, I give you an example. Would you publish yes, it? Yes, we did no? publish all the time. Yes. We made cover so you'd publish, with the all the time. You'd publish that, an article? No, no, an article. Let me finish. We ask, no, no, no. We it's don't, a yes we don't or no. Ms. Ress, it's a yes or no. Yes, would but you, you make it? a confusion between... Again, you're making a confusion between I'm not making AIDS confusion, and Ress. critical spirit. I think you're trying to confuse. Let me finish one thing. Let Please. me finish one thing. I'm afraid this must be your last answer, Caroline. Yes, Taylor. for example, uh, a lot of opponents of the Cartoons Affair said that the Yulin Poston was a very uh, uh, hate, hating about Muslims because they published uh, cartoons against uh, Mohammed, but they won't do it about Jewish. The same cartoonist who did the Mohammed with the bomb did a bomb with a symbol of Israel on it to denounce what is going on with the Palestinians. And we are completely, completely ready to publish the cartoons anti-Semitic that the Arab press is publishing to denounce it. We support freedom of speech, we don't support hate. Okay. Carolyn, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there is a, a question of whether, in order to judge the degree of offence, we should show the cartoons themselves. I mean, these are they. They're freely available on the internet. I've got copies. They depict the Prophet Muhammad in a range of guises, from a character in a police identity parade to one of a terrorist with a bomb strapped to his head. Uh, I, I want to ask the advocates, should we show the cartoons now? Kenan. Yes, we should. We're having a debate about free speech, and we're asking the audience and the viewers to make up their minds. It seems reasonable, therefore, to present them with the evidence, the cartoons, and let them decide. Right. If they're grown up enough to have a vote, they're grown up enough to look at the cartoons. Imran Khan. I'm against the showing the cartoons. It's simply an exercise, John, in gratuitous television. It's offending for the sake of offending. It's showing the cartoons because you have the power to show them. It's the same as embarrassing a participant on Big Brother. It simply reduces the dignity of all of us. Right. It does nothing to d advance the debate that we're having today. Imran Khan. Well, now that's the moment when uh, we turn to our studio audience, which we've tried to make as representative a cross-section of British society as possible. You've heard the arguments. I'd like you, please, to vote on whether we should show these cartoons in this programme. Should the Danish cartoons be shown? Vote one for yes. If you think we should not show them, then vote two for no. One for yes, two for no. Vote now, please. After the break, when film director Theo van Gogh depicted semi-naked women with Quranic texts, he paid with his life. We're joined by the film's producer. And, of course, we shall have the results of our vote. Welcome back to the Dispatches debate. We're discussing Muslims and free speech. Now, before the break, we asked our audience to vote on whether we should show the Danish cartoons that lampooned the Prophet Muhammad and provoked worldwide protests. Here are the results. And they are an overwhelming yes, 69% yes, 31% no. So, however, I have in this envelope a statement from Channel 4 on whether we can show the cartoons or not. <laughs> Channel 4 previously broadcast images which included the cartoons as part of our news reporting of the controversy earlier in the year. We are aware that the cartoons are designed to be deliberately provocative and have caused significant offence to Muslims. They should therefore be shown on television only if there is an overriding editorial justification. We do not believe there is such justification for their use in the debate. I want to bring us on to another case and another very important question. Does the concept of freedom of speech include the right to be offensive? Is there ever a justification for deliberately provoking a reaction? This is what the makers of the Dutch television film Submission set out to do. The film is about the alleged subjugation of women in Islam. 
It uses highly controversial images of verses from the Quran inscribed on a woman's body, images which we are not showing. The film's director, Theo van Gogh, was murdered and mutilated by an outraged Muslim man after it was broadcast. A note condemning the film was pinned to his chest. Our next guest is Heis van der Westlaken, who was the producer of this film, a friend and colleague of Theo van Gogh. Ken and Malik, your questions to Heis. What do you think would happen if we had to censor every comment, every image that somebody found offensive? Mm -hmm. We just did in this show. You didn't show the crucial scenes in, uh, from submission. You didn't show the cartoon. <laughs> the, wor the worst thing that can happen is self-censorship. And that's exactly what just happened. And that's worse than anything else. And what do you think the impact will be on the democratic process? Well, that, that's the beginning of the end of democracy. And of, free and of freedom, basically. Many people have suggested that submission is a racist film. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was written by a Muslim woman who relates um, her experiences. Do you think it's racist for a Muslim woman to say, these are the lessons I draw from my experiences as a woman living in Islamic society? Yeah, not at all. It's, uh, there's nothing shocking or revolutionary about that, I guess, I would say. Why do you think then people think of it as racist? Well, in her case, she's a woman and she's a heretic. She's an infidel, and that's probably the worst combination for uh, Islamic radicals uh, there is. And has the murder of Theo van Gogh made other filmmakers and writers think twice about t tackling the question of Islam or other controversial issues? Absolutely. It's, uh, uh, I haven't heard anything uh, in that order since, and rightly so. Uh, it's very sensible of, of people not to uh, try and say the things uh, Theo said, or Yanis Yali said, for that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ken and Malik. Uh, Imran Khan, it's now your questions to Heis. Mr. Van der Westlaken, believer in democracy, yes? Yes. <laughs> Do you think the debate about the position of women is advanced by featuring, say, nuns in pornographic films? That is all debatable. I've, of course, I understand Sorry, what you it, want. Please answer the question. Do you think the debate about the position of women in society is advanced by such a thing? Could be. Could be. How? Yeah. How? It could be because it could be uh, a way to, to enhance the debate, enforce it, and then put it on the map. Yeah. If you don't debate with strong issues. So you did it to advance the rights of women, is that right? Obviously. Well, I didn't make Obviously? the film, I produced it. Is well, that right? Obviously, that was the, the, the sole goal for Ayan Isiali and Theo van Gogh, was exactly to do that. Yeah. That was it, was it? So yeah. do you believe in the freedom of speech for anti-women violent pornography? I believe in freedom of speech for everybody within the boundaries of the law. Oh, but, hang on. <laughs> anti-women. I ask you a question. Do you believe in freedom of speech for anti-women pornography? Anything. Anything yes, so, within so, the boundaries of the law. So that goes, that's fine, yeah. is it? Yeah. I see. If it's within the boundaries of the law. So it's quite simple. Did you consider or did you, did you think the reaction of Muslim women standing up for their rights in Dutch society? Did you gauge their reaction? Did it enhance their ability to participate in the democratic process in Holland? Partly. There was a, there was a debate, for instance, with Ayane Siali uh, and with Islamic women. Uh, where half of them, you could say, uh, were against, and half were uh, uh, joined Ayan, you could say. And that was a strong debate, and there were uh, Islamic women uh, saying no to the film, basically. But there was a debate, and that's what it's debate. all about. But did it move? Did it give the rights to women in Holland? Absolutely. It gave yes. rights to women in Holland? Well, it put it on the map. It put, did it, that's it put a different it. question. Did it give rights to women? Did it advance the debate? Did it increase the democratic process? Absolutely, of course. In giving because rights anything, to Everything that, that has been put on an agenda enhances the, the democratic process. And as a believer... <laughs> Omar Khan, I'm afraid that's your allotted time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Geis uh, van der Westlaken. <laughs> you can take different views on whether or not freedom of speech implies a right to offend but is there also a right to be protected from offence?
and do faiths, including Islam, have a right to special protection? Our next guest is Ibrahim Mogra. He is the chair of Imams and Mosques for the Muslim Council of Britain. He has spoken out for the Muslim community on many of these recent controversies. Imran Khan, your questions to Ibrahim Mogra. Ibrahim, uh, when there are insults about Islam and when Jack Straw or Tony Blair demand or ask that women remove the veil in this country, what effect does it actually have uh, on the streets in Muslim communities? It's very un unfortunate that uh, those very sections of our communities that have been labelled as the voiceless community, uh, the bottom of the ladder sections of our communities, uh, that silent section of our communities, those women, have been attacked and have been set upon uh, by somebody who wishes to uh, promote their case. Uh, what this has led to is actually a further marginalization of this very small number of uh, women who we were hoping to bring into, if you like, mainstream life. Uh, it has added to the demonization of the Muslim communities. There has been an increase on attacks on veiled women, something that we never had before in a big way as such as this. Uh, and these women have been attacked specifically because they were wearing a veil. And when you have these headlines that we see in the press regularly, um, what is, how does the media portray um, the Muslim community with these headlines? How does it affect them? There is a drip drip uh, progress or, or effort in trying to create a picture as if Muslims are misfits. There's no space for Muslims in a democratic, pluralist society. We want to make space for ourselves and we expect the British public to accommodate us as we are, as long as we are abiding by the laws of the land. We do not wish to change anybody's way of life. We do not wish to um, impose our ways, of, our ways of life on anybody. All we want is to live in respect with one another. Uh, when you read newspaper headlines, they say, Muslim cabby refuses to carry a guide dog owner. Why does, why does the headline have to be Muslim cabby? Why could it not have been London cabby? I know London cabbies are wonderful people. Edmund Khan, thank you very much. Kevin Malik, your questions for Ibrahim Mogra. You consider it important to consider the rights of minorities. The real price of the kind of censorship you're talking about will be paid by the most vulnerable groups, including the most vulnerable groups within Muslim societies. I don't believe that because if you look at society as a whole, in, in fact people in your business and in your trade as well, there's always a case of self-censorship. There are things that uh, you regulate yourself. You make sure that uh, you make a, an editorial judgment or a judgment as Channel 4 have done and I applaud, applaud you for the decision of not showing the cartoons. Uh, we have other laws in our country that prevent you from saying exactly what you want to say. For example, we have uh, libel laws, we have race relation legislation, we have blasphemy laws, uh, we have so many other laws that make censorship laws that prevent you from saying exactly what you want to say. That does not mean that minority groups will suffer any worse than majority groups. This is not about minority and majority. But my point is that such censorship mostly affects those who are most vulnerable, uh, who have least access to power, which includes uh, women, lesbians and gays within Muslim communities, which is why women's organisations, lesbian and gay organisations within Muslim communities are opposed to the banning of offensive speech. If we reflect on what Mr Stroh has done, that's exactly what he has done. He has targeted a small group of our British community and he has marginalised them by refusing them the very right of freedom to choose that we today are debating here, that we have a freedom to choose. That's right, and women have the right to make that choice, and anybody else has the right to say they're wrong to wear, and it is wrong to have the veil in that fashion. I do not see what is offensive or Islamophobic about saying that. Nobody has said that Mr Straw does not have a right to say, I don't like this and I don't feel uncomfortable about that. There are many things I'm uncomfortable about, which I would wish to express, but for the greater good and to, to enhance the cohesion and the respect and harmony that we all desire for our communities, I choose to sacrifice my, my uh, right to exercise what I, what I believe is my freedom to say, and I don't, ex I don't behave in a selfish way, uh, but I, I look rather at the, at the greater good 
and swallow my pride or swallow my urge to say what I believe in saying to enhance the case for cohesion in our community. So are you suggesting Kevin Malik, Kevin Malik, I'm afraid that's your last question. That, that's the last question. Thank you very much. Abraham Mogra, thank you very much indeed. Next, a man who has led UK protests against the Pope's remarks about Mohammed last month. But first, let's take a break. Welcome back to the Dispatches debate. We're exploring tensions between Muslims and free speech. In a speech last month, the Pope quoted from a medieval theologian using these provocative words. Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Well, the result was another round of furious protests in many countries, including Britain. Our next guest is Taji Mustafa. He is a London-based representative of the Islamic group Hizbut Tahrir, which loudly condemned the Pope for what he said. Hizbut Tahrir is a controversial group within the Muslim community, and the government has threatened in the past to ban it. Imran Khan, your questions. You'd agree, Mr. Mustafa, like I think all people here, that the Pope is a very influential individual. Absolutely. He's a world statesman whose every word carries significance. Now, in terms of his comments, I have no problem with debates, with dialogue, with engaging with people. But why did he have to choose and hide behind the words of a 14th century emperor, describing Islam, as was just introduced by Jen Snow, in a provocative manner, saying that Islam brought nothing but evil and inhuman things. So firstly, that was the insult which caused such a furore, and I think rightly so in my opinion, and led to a lot of very peaceful demonstrations across the world, but it came in a context. This is a world where Bush is talking about Islam or fascist. Blair is talking about aspects of Islam being an evil ideology in their war on terror rhetoric. And in that frame came the Pope talking about Islam being evil. And so it's very easy to understand how these incendiary comments blew out. And so this added fuel to the war on terror propaganda, leaving Bush and Blair to carry on with their murderous wars, killing half a million people. And the world focuses on Jack Straw's comments, these ridiculous comments about whether the Pope made his insulting comments, rather than the real crimes which have been committed in our day and age. So, had those comments been made... <laughs> had those comments been made in a different context, would there have been the same sort of objection? Muslims have no problem with dialogue. My organisation globally distributed a challenge, a leaflet, an open challenge to the Pope. You want to discuss the substantive issues? Islam and violence, let's look at Christianity and violence. You're from the papacy, which has a very bloody history, may I say, in terms of the crusade. Let us sit down, let us sit down and discuss. We're not averse to discussion. But what Muslims will not accept, and what no human being, Muslim or not, should accept, gratuitous insults about their beliefs, their faith, or anything dear to them. It's done to provoke, not to debate. Is this that is right? not a debate. A pejorative, insulting statement. And in his speech, the whole of which I have read, he made a one-sided analysis that somehow Christianity is linked with reason, Islam is linked with violence. In front of him, when he's talking about violence and religion, in front of him is Tony Blair going to Iraq to spread by the gun his very beliefs in liberal democracy. Why didn't he analyze that in terms of people using violence to spread their beliefs? Why pick on Islam? So to be very, very clear, there's an agenda here that has an agenda to demonize, to vilify Islam as part of this global war on terror. And Muslims will not accept this vilification. And I think other people should be aware to it as well. One last question, one last question, because we've heard that there's no such thing as Islamophobia, that it doesn't exist. It's made up and people hide behind it in order to accuse people of racism and to stop freedom of speech. In your opinion, your experience, is there a rise in Islam? Does it exist? And what does it mean? Well, let's look at the last two weeks. Jack Straw's comments. John Reed followed in. You know, Muslim parents, you're very naughty the way you're raising your kids with a threat. Ruth Kelly, Muslim schools preach extremism. We've then had on the back of that, Muslim women being attacked. In Jack Straw's constituency, she was surrounded and told, take that thing off. Jack said so. What is this? This is pure evidence that the incendiary comments of politicians are leading to attacks and are diverting people from holding those politicians to account about their murderous wars and policies which is leading all of us to be unsafe. So definitely on the ground evidence points to the fact that these comments have a huge impact in community cohesion and relations between all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Imran Khan. Thank you.
Ken and Malik, your questions. Haven't we become too touchy-feely about everything? The Pope makes, in an offhand way, quote some medieval emperor uh, in a speech he makes, not about Islam, but about the relationship between science and religion. And everybody jumps on it. Doesn't it show that people are just waiting to get offended? The Pope's comments were largely about Islam. And Mr. Malik, would it be okay to uh, start in, with... Which you, have, you haven't, I'm sorry, you haven't, you, haven't, you haven't read the speech if you think... I have read the speech. You haven't read the speech if you I think it was largely speech. about Islam. He spoke art, about reason. The speech was about the relationship between religion and, uh, and science. And why did he single out one Islam off for criticism? There was, a, there was an offhand remark he made uh, about uh, uh, the uh, uh, question of Islam, um, uh, quoting a medieval emperor. The point I'm making is that people are waiting to get offended by those kinds of issues. Will you be offended if I insult your mom? Of course you'd be. As a reasonable, rational human being, I'd expect you to have things which upset you. And any of us here, does that give me the right to insult your mom gratuitously? Of course not. I'm a decent person. So when you do say things, they do cause offence. The Pope chose. Why hide behind? The words of a 14th century, why? This is a professor of theology, Cardinal Ratzenberg, now the Pope. He could have chosen a million and one things to say. Why in this climate, war and terror, demonization of Muslims across Europe, in that you, Mr. Pope, it's highly irresponsible to come with such quotes. And surely he of all people should know better. Muslim leaders, Islamic organizations, including yours, are not exactly known for their progressive views about gays, women, Jews, and so on. Isn't the spectacle of you accusing the Pope of backward views a bit like Donald Trump accusing Bill Gates of having too much money? That's a ridiculous contrast. <laughs> if I may say so, that's a ridiculous contrast. The reality is what? People have a right, when they are offended, to say so. Don't you ever get offended? Do you expect 20 million? Absolutely. How do you expect and I would say relations? so. But, but the, the point is that uh, I, ex I also uh, accept the right of anybody to offend me. What you're demanding, you're demanding the freedom to insult. <laughs> Let's be very, very clear. In this debate, which is not about freedom of speech, you're demanding the freedom to insult. In no I'm civilized happy, society. I'm happy for people to insult me. In I no think civilized people should have, society. I think people should have the right in to no, insult me. That is the most uncivilized thing. In no civilized society should people accept the right to insult others. Jews should not be insulted. Christians should not be insulted. And me as a Muslim or anybody else should not have to live in a society where my beliefs are insulted. Will that lead to harmony? Will that not lead to tensions? So it's very irrational, illogical and nonsensical to say it's okay to go around insulting one another. Taji Mustafa, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, in a moment, we want to give our audience a final vote on where they stand on Muslims and free speech. But first, our final guest is Shami Chakrabarti. Uh, she is the director of the British pressure group Liberty, which campaigns to protect freedom of speech. Your questions, Imran Khan. Shami, why should we exercise restraint on freedom of speech now, in the present moment? Well, I think it's important, um, if I may say so, in this very sexy television polarised debate, to make a distinction between your right, your legal right in a free society of a, a free speech, not unfettered, because we don't want child pornography and incitement to murder. So, so there's always some, you know, there's always some necessary and proportionate limitations on free speech. But but let's separate your legal right that I would defend to the death, actually, from whether as a moral, ethical, sensible, sensitive, polite, individual human being, you choose on a given day, in a given format, to say this or that. That's really, really important. You have a right um, of, of, of free speech, but it's not a duty to always um, to say the most offensive thing possible. <laughs> And I might add that free speech is under attack in this country, but not from Muslims or Christians or, or just people of faith, but from big brother politicians, from, you know, there's a... There's, there, was a there was a teenager, there was a teenager who was given a fixed penalty notice. He, uh, when he walked down the street with his friend, his friend said, what did you do at the weekend? And he said, bleep all.
you can work out what the, what the missing word was. Okay? So yes, free speech is under attack, but it's a bit of a shame that we're talking about it as if it's just from Muslims, because it's not. It's not. Can, Thank I, you very can, much I, can I... Can I... One last question. One last yep. question. We've heard that um, there's no such thing as attacks on Muslims, that, that, that there's no such thing as this rise in Islamophobia. Mm. I, I don't want to bore the audience with statistics, but just from your expertise, your experience, as an organisation mm. working in this field, what is the state of attacks on Muslims in this country in Western Europe? The, the idea that, 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 that Muslims in the current climate haven't been under attack is, if you pardon my French, buzzcocks. Thank you. But let me say this. I want, I passionately defend free speech and other liberal values. Freedom of expression is incredibly important. So why don't we lead by example? Right? If we want to say to, to, to Muslims, as, as I do, we're in solidarity and friendship, don't be overly offended by profane cartoons. Right? Sticks and stones will break your bones, but not cartoons. If we want to say that, then why should we be so offended by women who choose to wear a headscarf or a hoodie or anything else? Imran Khan, thank you very much. <laughs> Ken, Malik, Ken and Malik, your questions to Shami Chakrabarti. Hi. I agree with you that the right to free speech does not include a duty to offend, just as the right to divorce does not mean that we all have to get divorced in the morning. That's right. But the right to free speech must include the right to give offence, just like the right to divorce means we can get divorced in the morning. Don't you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. As a legal right, because we will disagree about what is offensive and, and what is gratuitous and whatever, as a, as a legal right... We cannot have this nationalisation of personal ethical space so that either because there are threats of violence or threats of prosecution, we can't have conversations, we can't rub, rub along together. But what we need is to be individual, moral, ethical beings, sensible people, which are actually in this country for, for hundreds of years we broadly have been, and make these individual decisions about what to say and where to say it. Free speech is often seen as the enemy of minorities. Do you agree with that? Not at all. Everybody is entitled to their human rights, but sometimes in a democracy, it's, it's minorities who need human rights protection the most. In other, words, the real... in other words, the real problem is not free speech as such, but the failure to apply it universally. What we need is more free speech, not less. We certainly need an even-handed application. So, as I say, free expression and conscience means sometimes you get to wear what you like as well as say what you like. But also, I have to say that even when we're talking about laws, there's no such thing in any democracy, in our imagination or in history, that has unfettered free speech. Look at the importance of child pornography, incitement to murder, uh, uh, and some other necessary and proportionate restrictions in law. Shami Chakrabarti, thank you very much indeed. So, what do our audience think? I want to bring this to a final vote. You've got to consider all the arguments you've heard. So, is it right to sacrifice freedom of speech to avoid causing offence to Muslims? Ken and Malik, what's your final word to the audience? Well, Imran Khan suggests that because of hostility to Islam, we must protect Muslims from too much free speech. I believe that he exaggerates the extent of that hostility, not because it doesn't exist, it certainly does, but because it doesn't exist to the extent that he talks about, and the idea of Islamophobia is all too often used to silence critics of Islam. But even if it was true that Britain is a deeply Islamophobic nation, ask yourself this, who is it that most benefits from censorship? Not the powerless and the vulnerable, but rather that those that bo possess both the power to censor and the necessity to do so. Free speech is the friend, not the enemy of minorities, including Muslims. We should defend it as the bedrock of an open, diverse, democratic society. Imran Khan, your final word, please. Uh, I think what we've seen tonight is that rich Danish newspaper owners and their counterparts want to attack and not start a debate. I think we've seen a, a defence of the right of pornographers, not those who support women's rights, 
I think we've seen a media bias from top to bottom, owned by the rich and powerful, defending itself under this banner of free speech. The thing is, the right of free speech is in the hands of very few. All the more reason why alarm bells should ring when one community, one single community, is singled out for systematic offence. Muslims are being vilified twice. Firstly, through the publication of offensive material, and secondly, for exercising their democratic right to protest. To paraphrase Steve Biko, the South African black nationalist, not only are they kicking us, they are telling us how to react to being kicked. Isn't that what's really happening? Well, there are the advocates' arguments. You've heard them. Before we come to the vote, let's uh, hear from some of you. I know some of you have kind of made up your minds before you ever got here. I'm wondering whether we've changed any of them. Uh, where are you on this issue? Um, I think you can have freedom of speech, but it's got to have balance, fairness, responsibility, and respect. Um, it's okay to... That means you're with Imran Khan. I think I am. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, what about you? Uh, I think that uh, too much is made out of uh, the Muslim feelings, and I think that Christian... We're oversensitive. Yeah, we're oversensitive. This is a Christian country, basically, and so therefore, <laughs> when are our views going to be heard? There's Thank too you. Much, there is too much time spent on the Muslim problem. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I don't agree with any of them. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> where, where does that take us? <laughs> I think freedom of speech shouldn't be curtailed, uh, but I think what we need right now is a dialogue between both cultures, and the way freedom of speech is being used uh, is driving both sides to the extremes. Uh, so how can you expect Muslims to integrate when you're insulting their symbols? Uh, however, I don't think putting legislation is the answer. Thank you very much. And um, what about you? Um, I wouldn't mind my mum being insulted if it allowed me to insult other people. So you're for unfettered free speech? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, that's the moment then that we want you now to vote. Um, are Muslims threatening freedom of speech? Vote one for yes, vote two for no. Please vote now. Well, the result is in. Our studio audience has voted. Let's take a look at what their findings were. Are Muslims threatening freedom of speech? Very interesting indeed. Extraordinarily close. And a tremendous tribute to both our advocates for uh, this very interesting vote. To the question, are Muslims threatening freedom of speech? That result clearly seems to indicate that in a multicultural society, there is too high a price to be paid for unfettered free speech. Freedom from offence is an equally important right for all to enjoy. A very interesting finding and a very interesting opening salvo for your national debate, Prime Minister. That's it from us. Thank you very much for watching Dispatches. It's back again on Monday, same time. Good night. Has a self-made millionaire businesswoman met her match in the shape of a five-year-old girl? Wife Swap, next on 4.